Welcome to today's episode of Office Hours. This is episode number 14, episode 14. And today, as with all days like it, I, GM Adam, am going to answer some of your questions about game mastering. Today's questions all follow kind of a similar theme and that they tend to be about the art of the GM as describer, right? As explainer of the situation, uh, as, as provider of universal detail, and as the sort of um, brush with which the campaign universe is painted. It's something that a lot of folks ask about uh, a lot of people, I think, worry that they're not, you know, poetic enough or they're not um, uh, quick enough thinkers to be able to describe in the ways that they want. Or they try to aim for this sort of prose, poetry, scenery, chewing, kind of um, Lovecraftian approach to uh, description in games, right? where we over-describe. We don't describe the 10 foot by 10 foot room. We describe the glistening squamous walls coated in a rust-tasting moss that erodes the very mortar that Cyclopean Cthuloid... etc. So, you know, this is the thing. This is the thing that people worry about. There's lots of different ways to worry about whether or not you're describing things properly. These three questions I've chosen kind of break that down into uh, some, some different sub-questions. And mostly, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, improving one's ability to describe things as a game master. So let's get started. This one's nice and simple, very straightforward. Might be the shortest recorded question in the history of Office Hours. Here it comes. Hey, Adam. It is Josiah, and my question is, how do you make locations more interesting? Bam. Straight and to the point, Josiah asks, how do we make locations more interesting? So interesting is interesting is a bit relative, right? Because interesting is uh, a byproduct of all the people at the table and the shit they're buying into, right? We could talk about how to make them more interesting in regards to our own sense of, uh, of excitement in the game, right? How do you make them more interesting to you as the GM? How do you make them more interesting to the players so they'll engage with them? Uh, so I'm going to try and take a, uh, a broad view of it and approach interesting as a more general creating and engaging the interest of everyone at the table vis-a-vis -vis location. So location as we take up the role of game master, right? When we when we become GMs, we assume responsibility of describing a certain part of the gameplay at the table, right? Players describe the things that their characters are doing and sometimes thinking and feeling, always saying. We are the ones who are responsible for describing what is often called the setting. And the setting isn't just stuff like what tavern in what town in what kingdom the PCs are currently in. It's not just the history of the game. We're informing the players of everything that's going on around them. Uh, we're talking about all kinds of stuff. And setting is both where the characters are and, and this is what's going to be important to answering the rest of this question, it's about what's going on in that place, right? Events are as much a part of your responsibility to create setting as the static elements of location are. So for me, with that in mind, the easiest way to make locative elements of your GMing more interesting is to give them life by way of action, either existing or potential, right? We want to imbue our locations with a sense of potentia around things happening within them. So when you describe a place, you're telling the characters, you're telling the players by way of what their characters can perceive, what's going on in that place, the people moving through it, the motion and the energy of the place. You want to make your locations ripe with potential for stuff because setting without action is irrelevant. Right, uh, a setting with no action is a is a 
picture. It's a map. It's, it's nothing. It's something you can look at and say, oh, hmm, interesting, that exists. But you can't have gameplay without action. And PCs, as we've talked about many times before, PCs are aspects of change in the world. They are momentum, they are movement. And a location is only as good as the opportunity that you give your players to make change, to affect change in the location. So when you're planning a game and you're thinking about locations, always, always, always think about what could happen here, right? Because your locations are a backdrop for the important parts of the game, uh, which is to say what's going to happen in the moment. So you can think literally and, and generically first. Let's, um, let's use a, a tavern as an example, right? PC spent a lot of times in taverns, and this could be a tavern, it could be a, a bar, it could be a space bar, it could be a post-apocalyptic bar, whatever. People like to get together and drink and eat and talk. And so what are some things that in a tavern could happen? What do you do in a tavern, right? I'm sure you can think of lots. You could, um, you could buy a drink, you could buy several drinks, you could buy too many drinks, uh, you could eat a meal, you could listen to the local bard play a song, you could get in a bar fight, you're probably going to get in a bar fight, uh, you could hit on a sexy waiter, you could gather rumors from the local drunks, you could interrogate the, uh, the barkeep, you can arrange for a place to sleep for the night, you can create safety, you could find someone to rob, right? There's all kinds of stuff that happens in this location. But describing a tavern away from that action is describing nothing. It's of no use. Right? And I'm not saying you have to give the players all these options, but when you describe things, you need to hint at them. And these are things that give the location context in the narrative. Right? Because without context in the narrative, we're looking at flat spaces with no prompt. It creates simple, straightforward reasons for the characters to be there, and it gives you a mindset to start from when you look to your players to say, what do you do now? Right? You can look at, and I, I think this is really important, you can look at your characters' abilities and their desires as translated to you from the player's desires, uh, by way of the mechanics of the game, right? So if you're playing a game that highlights these kinds of things specifically, there should be obvious actions that stand out and say to you, these are reasons for these characters to be here, right? So like uh, Fate, the various aspects in that game, your character's aspects, they're going to be given context by the location that they're in. A character who likes to get in fights is going to get in a different kind of fight in a bar than they would in a prison, or a swamp filled with lizard men, right? The various aspects will teach you what to include in your description of that location so as to trigger the players looking at their character sheet and saying, hey, this is a place I could get in a fight. This is where this will come into play. If you're playing Burning Wheel, your beliefs and your instincts should give you a reason for every character to be in a place or give you something that you can hook a player with when they're in that place. So if a character has a belief like uh, all the servants of the Grey God are cowards, putting a servant of the Grey Gods in a situation in which they can show their cowardice is going to cue off of that, uh, that player's belief. Right, so again, look at the characters. Why are they there? Why would they be in this location? What is the action that spawns from that? And describe the place in a way that's going to impart some of the potential action uh, right off the bat. Right? And the reason this matters is because context is what makes people give a shit about locations. Right? Beautiful descriptions of a place that take 60 seconds or two minutes or three minutes to roll off are going to be met with blank stares of players who have nothing to do if these are not descriptions worth some kind of additional action. Right? We don't, we don't care what Rivendell looks like because it's beautiful. We care about Rivendell because that's where Elrond lives, and, and there's going to be a big meeting here. This is where that meeting takes place. And your description of Elrond and your description of Rivendell and the two together are what makes this location matter, right? And when you do that sort of thinking, when you go into the moment thinking about how the place will reflect on the meeting, for example, with Rivendell, you can describe things to set the tone literally setting the stage for the thing to come. So the, the meeting of the Fellowship in, in Lord of the Rings would have been very difficult 
uh, had Rivendell been described as a uh, post-apocalyptic war, a uh, torn village, and there's fire, and there's, you know, the, the ceiling's collapsing, and Elrond has been shot. Like, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't translate directly into this expectation. And it's fun to screw with expectation, but keep in mind that your description of a place should lead to action. It should lead into what's going to happen in this place. You know, we don't, we don't care about Tatooine because it's a big dust ball, right? We care about it because that's where Luke Skywalker is from. And we care about it because of some other crap, but we don't, we don't talk about that anymore. Luke Skywalker's from Tatooine. That's all you need to know. So the thing is that action is what makes games interesting. I don't mean just like action action, but just like shit happening. And specific character action, specifically desired character action, tie the location to your game at hand. Now, as for doing the bettering your descriptions part of this work, right? As for creating a better sense of imparting the details from your mind to your players, basically all the tricks that you would use to talk about, like NPCs, for example, can be used for places too. Um, for example, like most people can't keep more than three things in their head about a given thing, right? An NPC, an object, a place. You just pick the three most important things about this place and use those. You impart those to the people who are playing your game. Um, so let's, let's try one, okay? Um, so let's describe uh, Arrakis. Arrakis is the desert planet in Dune. Uh, it's the center of the universe. It is a very living location. It, it, it very much is a part of the situation at hand. It's a well-imparted setting. What are the three things that we need to know about Arrakis, the desert planet of Dune, right? Well, uh, it's a desert planet, right? Because that sets the stage in terms of all kinds of stuff. There's a scarcity of water. It's a dangerous environment. Uh, there is sand everywhere. You're probably not going to run into very many oceans. Um, it's inhospitable. It doesn't deal well with the soft, right? So desert planet, that's a thing. It is a desert planet that imparts all kinds of information. That's one point, right? Two, it's the only source of spice in the whole universe. You can't get spice anywhere else, right? Again, reinforcing the scarcity. Suddenly, this isn't just some desert shithole. This is the most important desert shithole in the entire universe. Right? And then third, it's home to, uh, to the Fremen, right? So despite the first thing, despite the inhospitable nature, people live here. There is a culture living and breathing here. That means there are people to interact with. That means there are people to agree or disagree with, to make alliances with, to become enemies with. It's got space in it for NPCs. This is different from a desert planet where nobody lives, right? You're, you're telling the, the players of your Dune game, your hypothetical Dune game, that there are people here and they will be important. Those are our three things about Arrakis. And really, that's all you need to know to start because the context of the character, say a member of House Atreides, a member of House Harkonnen, a member of the Landstrad, a member of the Guild, these characters are all tied to Dune and they give that place meaning in the same way that Dune, as a place, imparts meaning to the characters. It's a fictionally tied up space with what you want your narrative to be. One flows easily from the other, the narrative, the location, characters, locations, that kind of thing. So all of that can be built into um, your, your location. It's all important to the location. You can think about things that are literal and easily observed. Things like, what kind of place is this? What is this place made from? What kinds of sights, smells, and sounds can be found here? Right? The, the cinnamon spell, smell of the spice. Uh, the, um, the crowded sieges of the Fremen. Uh, again, we talked about the desert planet. And by contrast, the Atreides Garden, right? So once you've established a baseline for describing a place, describing things that are incongruous to that place suddenly make it stand out all the more. It's the exception that proves the rule, right? If you say, these are the Shadowlands, now here in the Shadowlands, nothing grows. Then you describe to the players, you come across the only tree in the, in the entire Shadowlands, growing strong and bold from the ground uh, amidst the darkness and the clouds. This suddenly gives that tree context because it matters in contrast to 
the Shadowlands, to this place where nothing can grow, right? So thinking about that idea, and this is an NPC trick too, the, it's like this, but it's different in this way, is one thing you can do in terms of literal observational stuff about the place. You can think about the placement of this location in terms of the rest of the world. Uh, is it in a bad part of town? Is it a room in a military bunker? Is it somewhere safe or is it unsafe? Is it considered to be one thing but is in actuality another, right? Is this the ancient home of the elves rumored to be a land of milk and honey but in truth is a, a, a land of corpses and disintegration, right? Are we, are we seeing things in a way that is expected or unexpected? Right? Because that's something you can do by way of your NPCs. Oh, don't go to Castle Grayskull, everybody there is a madman, and then you arrive and Castle Grayskull is actually pretty cool. You know, it, it gives you the opportunity to, to contrast, to create conflict. Think about whether or not the location is a smaller part of a larger whole. So is it a building in a city? Is it a room in a dungeon? And if so, how is it different than the bigger picture? What qualities does it share? And you can use this in terms of cultural issues too. You can say, uh, this city is composed of um, men and women from the north, right? This is a, a stout town far to the north and it's full of northmen, right? They're, they're a tough Viking folk. And then you can also be like, oh, this is the, this is the Muslim temple in the Northman village, right? This is where uh, the African priest who traveled north uh, and set up this temple, uh, this is where he lives and, and preaches, right? So you can, uh, you can create, again, contrast within uh, a larger space by saying that it's different than the place that it's in. And you can do this in um, dungeons as well, right? If a dungeon is one way, you can create rooms or sub-dungeons that are different. And that creates, again, contrast. Um, you want to give these places life by way of human, and I mean human in, in so much as like sentient creatures with culture and thought and behavior in the setting. So NPCs, factions, whatever. So to whom is this place special, if anyone? Who loves this place? Who would, who would die to see it stay? Who hates it? Who would, who would die to see it burn to the ground? When they are here, who feels at home? Who feels like an alien in this place, literal or, or otherwise? How does this place change the feelings of those who spend time in it? For example, the local constable is going to be calm and peaceful, probably, in a temple devoted to the god of order, but might feel on edge in a bar owned by the Thieves' Guild. Because again, NPCs give context to locations, but locations can give context to NPCs. So think about the ways that the people who are occupying this space are feeling about it. Because often PCs will, players by way of their character, will take hints from the ambient behavior of, of NPCs. So if you say everyone in this room is really uncomfortable, right? They're fidgeting nervously. They seem to be waiting for something bad to happen. That's very different than if you say everyone here is in a joyous mood, cheering and drinking and singing songs. Now they can be doing those two behaviors in a tavern or a brothel or a temple to the death god, it's just about creating contrast, right? I think the thing is, is that you want to keep your descriptions of places simple and clear using as few words as possible to invoke as much as you can about the place. Now, it can be really tricky because often what you end up doing as a GM when you're trying to describe stuff is add more words. It's a bit like painting. You keep painting and painting and painting and at some point you should have stopped, but you're like, no, maybe a little bit more red, maybe a little more blue. Uh, now, mm, now it's too purple, let's add some yellow. Uh, well, I don't like that, let's, let's throw some orange and some brown down here, right? So like you can definitely over evoke, you can, you can bore people. There are, there are so many adventures with box text that's two like pages long of just GM describe the entire town to the players. And by the time you get within a paragraph or two, players will just zone out. Try to keep it short, evocative, and we'll talk a little bit more about evoking creative intent in a later question today. Keep in mind that no matter how you go at this, 
whether you're doing most of your work in advance or improvising it, your descriptions exist for two reasons. To impart factual information to the players of what's around them so that they can use that information to create their own description. And two, demand action, right? No matter the location you're describing, no matter how you're describing it, always, always end your description with, what do you do? And that goes for any game. You know, I, that's a game, that's a Powered by the Apocalypse trick, but you can use it in anything and it will always work out great for you as long as your descriptions demand action, right? Which is what, we are, what we're after. So the second question we have today uh, comes from a, an obvious viewer of uh, at least Swan Song um, and talks a little bit about the way that we describe this content, the way that we get at narrating our way through the, uh, through the world, some tips and tricks around how that might be done. Hey, Adam, my name is Patrick. Something I've noticed you do is frame a lot of the descriptions of your world like a movie. Like, say, we cut over to these characters or... Uh, first, we're going to show some B-roll of Seattle. Uh, what do you think the advantages of the system are? Would you recommend it to other GMs? Uh, thanks. Thank you, Patrick. I always love when um, when people quote or paraphrase my GMing because sometimes I think, okay, did I actually say that? Because sometimes things like we show some B-roll of Seattle, that's a thing that I would definitely say when describing a game. That feels like a quote from Mirror Shades. So... Uh, I'm a GM who likes to lead by example. I like to think that when I'm GMing, the things that I'm saying and doing in my live games, if you're watching Swan Song or Mirror Shades, Balance of Power, Roll20 Presents, any of those shows, I'd like to think that the things I'm doing are behavior that in this context, understood properly, uh, will allow people to absorb that technique and use it at their table, right? I don't want to be a... Uh, do as I say, not as I do kind of GM. And obviously I still struggle a little bit with that. Everybody does. But I'd like to think that this cinematic style of GMing is something that for some people in some situations uh, can can work, right? And I'm going to talk about what situations it might work in and what it might not and kind of how I got to that point and what's useful to um, to you as a, as a player. So... Again, this is a thing we can blame Swan Song for, but I don't think 100% that that's where its origins are for me, right? Certainly it's not advice that I, it's not a thing I invented. GMs have been doing this a long time. I'm just maybe the most visible doing it right now. Um, and I think that the first time I ever saw this advice, this style of GMing was in an old, I don't know if it was D20 or West End Games, but it was an old Star Wars supplement. It was talking about describing like a waterfall and some TIE fighters. I can't remember the exact paraphrase, but the idea was how to describe cinematically what was going on in your game, which I think is fitting because Star Wars is, I don't know if you know this, is based on a movie, a series of movies, and very much demands a, a cinematic portrayal. I don't think you can do the 10 foot by 10 foot room with an orc and a treasure chest in it, style of GM description using Star Wars. People expect a certain snap hiss and lens flare and, you know, cinematic uh, quality uh, from Star Wars. But it doesn't have to just be for games that are based on that kind of media. So let's, let's lay out exactly what I think the question asker, what Patrick here think, what I think he means when we refer to this sort of weird thing that's sort of that's taken over my GMing in a lot of ways. Um, so I've started to describe my games as though the players and the audience, uh, some of which are probably you, uh, we're watching a film or a TV show in which the characters are the principal actors. Right? Um, I'll do things like describe subtitles as they appear at the bottom of the screen, right? We see, a, we see a planet emerge from the bottom of the screen. It's blue, a thin atmosphere. It gives off a, a foreboding cold, and we see underneath, you know, Hoth, right? So I'll describe subtitles. I'll describe transitions between scenes. Um, and man, this is there are a lot of different kinds of transitions. I think I've even managed to, to squeeze a heart wipe into Mirror Shades. It's my favorite. It's the big, like, a heart appears. Or like, more often it's a wipe. It's like a zoom in. 
on two people. Sometimes they're kissing. Anyway, I'll describe things like establishing shots. I'll describe close-ups or zooms or pans. And I've even started at this point describing artifacts of the cinema, right? In Balance of Power, the Star Wars campaign that I'm running, I've started describing things like lens flares on overbright shots or the level of saturation in, in the color of a scene. Um, I'll describe a soundtrack that we as the audience can imagine hearing, right? And I think for Star Wars, some of this stuff works because it's so ingrained, right? Like I can describe, you know, Princess Leia's theme and people who are Star Wars nerds will get it. It's sort of a reward for those, uh, those folks. And these are really, for the most part, just magician's tricks to help immerse the players in the audience in the kind of universe I want them to imagine, right? I, as a GM and as a consumer of media, tend to be most affected by TV and film. And so this is the language that I have come to rely on when I GM in that space. And honestly, it's not the only way, not by a long shot, right? Like if I were more versed in or playing, for example, a, a game more appropriate to a comic book feeling, I could describe freeze frames on panels. I could describe thought bubbles or speech bubbles. Uh, I could describe uh, notes from the editor or full page spreads. I just haven't played that game yet. And so haven't had to use that language. The advantage that I've found is that I don't know, it's, for me, it's kind of hard to separate the medium in which I'm GMing, right? Like so much of why I do these sort of tricks is because I want to imply a very specific vibe to a large group of people in a language that's more or less universal, right? Like if I describe a steady cam shot of someone running down a hallway or I describe a um, shaky cam shot of a spaceship, right? We start to call on what we know about those things and we make associations between what I'm describing and the thing that you know you've seen before, right? Shaky cam spaceship, you're going to start probably thinking about Firefly, right? Long tracking shots give you this sort of old school feel of cinematography of, you know, I, I could describe a, a letterbox shot very tightly framed of a, a sweeping Montana scene. And you're going to start thinking about spaghetti westerns. You're going to think about that genre of film. And it's because I'm leveraging in the same way that I leverage the language that I'm speaking in, right? In the same way I'm leveraging English as a language, I'm leveraging the language of or the poetry of a visual medium that at this point is accessible to most people, right? And you can compare and contrast this with things like um, uh, the uh, the wrestling RPG, Nathan Pellet's wrestling RPG, or Tenra Bancho Zero, or things like that. The idea that uh, games that are created is especially in emulation of a certain media, will carry with them, if they're well-designed games, they'll carry with them mechanisms to emulate that media, right? Tenra has the sort of kabuki uh, group participation vibe. Um, the uh, War Wrestling game has its, uh, its roots in the idea of professional wrestling and the audience there. So sometimes these are built right into the game, but more often than not, they're not. And so what I'm doing is just leveraging my understanding of film and TV as a consumer of those things, as a student of that kind of culture, to try to get you as an audience in the headspace of, uh, of that stuff. And if you'll notice, if you'll notice when I give them the opportunity, more often than not, Wheat or Jeff or Steven or JP, uh, will start to take the reins and do the same, right? Because they're thinking cinematically too. And that, for me, is how I feel like I'm doing my job, right? Not just because I impart it to you, but because the players are starting to understand that this is the world I want to build around them. So when they say, like the last episode of Balance of Power, uh, JP described his character as being shot from the boots up and described the soundtrack swelling and like flashbacks as we got that slow pan up. It was beautiful because I didn't have to encourage that. It was a thing that the players picked up. In the same way I was saying before, like I wanna be a good example to my players and get them on board with these things. You can, you can see that start to happen and your players will hopefully start to do it too. 
I mean, everything for me, I, I use the language of film because everything that happens in a film visually is done for a particular reason, right? Choices of focus, of lighting, music and timing, it's done to highlight aspects of a scene. It's to force the viewer to focus on something the filmmaker wants you to see. The most obvious example of this is like hard and soft focus, right? If I'm speaking and I'm in focus, but there's someone behind me out of focus, it creates a sense of tension that there is this person behind us and maybe you can't see them because I can't see them, or maybe we're waiting for them to make their move and then suddenly it snaps the focus to them, they've got a knife, the tension bursts, it's a, an action sequence, right? We get these tools as filmmakers to, to do these things and I'm just stealing them, I'm just taking them away. And it's a technique that allows you to highlight things in the mind's eye of your players. Right, like let's let's compare and contrast, right? Let's compare and contrast. I'm gonna, uh, so it's a, like a 12 by 10 foot room and inside the room there's a desk. Uh, it's got a PC with a couple of monitors, um, some studio lights, there's some miscellaneous stuff on the desk, a couple of controllers, a pencil case, a cell phone, uh, a glass of whiskey. Uh, the room is dark, but when you turn the light on, um, all the lights uh, illuminate the room, and now you can you can see it in better detail. Okay, I've just I've described the room. You, you can get an okay idea in your mind's eye of what my studio looks like, but it doesn't impart any meaning, right? So let's try this again. So we start on a tight shot of a microphone, like a tight macro shot of a microphone. The silver mesh is reflecting a blurry document behind it on a nearby computer screen. As we pan back from the, uh, from the microphone, we can see the, the screen better and there is indeed a document there. It's been edited a bunch of times, there's red lines through things, but we can't see the words on them yet. We get more and more of the room revealed. There's a worn chair, there's uh, some office clutter on the desk, and a subtitle bleeds into place against the dark background that says 10.45 a.m., two days before the incident. A switch clicks on. It's the sound of something out of frame. Lights turn on in the room. Someone enters. Which of you is the first one, and what do you do when you come into the office? Right? There's, there's so much more, it's a bigger description, but there's so much more meaning imparted by the idea of what you're forced to focus on, right? If you just inventory list uh, a room, players will gravitate to whatever they think is the most valuable vis-a-vis -vis the game they're playing. The objectives their characters have, the objectives the players have in playing it, and uh, the objectives set forth by the current narrative. But if you frame it up as a specific scene rather than just a space, and this goes back to the first question, you can give the players some inspiration to know what to focus on or even ask them more questions. Like, what the hell is the incident? Using this descriptive model gives you the ability to be cinematographer in your own game universe. You build a description piece by piece in a way that evokes feeling. It invokes mood, not just invokes inventory. And inventory is useful, but you want to paint with a, a more interesting brush than that. Now, don't, don't overdo it. You know, you want to stick to the general principle of describing things in a concise way, stick to the sort of principle of threes, give your players opportunity for action. But it tends to bleed a little bit of the tra traditional narrative away from the players in the GM, as you might expect. So what I mean by that is that you can often describe things in a way that characters won't be perceiving. Unless you're playing kind of a self-aware slapstick Deadpool kind of game, the characters don't get to read the subtitles. So that is fun and can be kind of funny, right? So, you know, like someone, if you were playing that kind of game tonally, the characters walk into the room, one of them could say, yeah, I look at the subtitles, they're backwards, so I have to get around the other side of them. Um, what the hell is the incident, right? You can, you can do that, but you've set that tone in advance. Now, Letting the players know things that the characters don't can either be really fun and liberating or total fucking heresy, depending on who you learn to GM from and the school of GMing you tend to belong to, because it violates what constitutes a very, very serious line for some players. Players of role-playing games, GMs, PCs, whatever, right? Because some people uh, struggle with this effort to avoid the great terror of metagaming, right? Some GMs refuse, flat out, straight up refuse to describe or narrate or allow access to anything the players have not directly observed. Uh, this is 
to keep player knowledge and character knowledge on par, which I think is a, I mean, it's a, it's a fruitless activity, but we won't go into that. Um, because players will always know different things in the characters. Like for one, they're playing a game and the characters will always know things that the players don't, right? Like bits and pieces about the universe they're in and how it works. Um, but whatever, that's, that's fine. In my mind, that kind of GMing tends to eliminate a lot of potential drama and excitement for both the players, the GM, well, and I guess in third, the audience. Um, handled well and with mature players, this narrative style can describe things the players haven't seen or weren't present for. Right? Star Wars, if you imagine Star Wars as a, as a campaign, a tabletop role-playing game campaign, um, Star Wars does this shit all the time. You see Darth Vader hiring the bounty hunters that'll eventually chase down and capture Han Solo. Once the players uh, in the Millennium Falcon make their daring escape in the Death Star, we snap to Darth Vader being like, hey, we put a tracking device in them, of course, right? And you can let the characters stay in the dark, but let the players know this. And if we can trust the players to police their own shit around this stuff and play along with the premise of the game we've all sat down to play, you can narrate these scenes to create a sense of foreboding or excitement. You can be subtle if you want to and, and not be clear about exactly what's happened, right? So you could say, uh, as we see the player's spaceship leave the dock, you know, battle damage uh, on the obvious on the hull. We see them take off into hyperspace. We cut to a shadowy figure on board the bridge of their own ship. They pull a couple of switches and turn a knob, and we can suddenly see a map of the universe. And on it, blinking, you know, the swan song or whatever. Right? So someone is obviously following you, but maybe you don't know it's Boba Fett. Maybe you don't know Darth Vader sent him. You can you can create a, a degree. Uh, you know, I, I like to imagine as a GM, you have all of these tonal control knobs and dials, right? And you can use this particular skill, the idea of off-screening stuff, uh, you can turn it up or down, and right? it can be as intense or as, uh, as, as chill as you want. Um, you know, like any GMing technique that you're new to, you want to start small, you want to start subtle, and you want to practice the little things. You know, all the, all the small things at first... And you want to be clear with your players, this is something that you're interested in doing. And, like, for example, we started getting more cinematic with Swan Song. I started doing the, like, meanwhile, on Asa. Um, you know, I asked the players, I checked in on the regular, checking in. It's a thing you should do. Anyone with authority should check in with the people they're working with. Um, I asked them, hey, are you, you guys digging this? Is this feeling cool to you? Do you like having this information? Are you feeling weird about your players knowing things your characters don't? And, you know, they, they said they're good, right? They, they enjoyed it. 201, they were all into it. And uh, they said, yes. Yeah. So, you know, I, I kept it up. And it's become what it is today. I mean, you can get better at this primarily by immersing yourself in the things that inspire you. But I'll leave the details for that for our last question. So in today's third question, uh, there, this one's nice and specific. It comes from a specific game, but can be applied to all games. Uh, as with so much of what we do as GMs, every game that we learn is learned not only in a vacuum, but as part of a continua of other role-playing games. We learn from a game, we apply those learnings to the next thing, and we apply those learnings to the next thing, and we go back and forth and we, we pick things up. So this is specifically about some advice from a particular game, and we'll go over that, but it's also about more generally applying that advice to every game. Hi, Adam. My name's Joe. I want to get better at impromptu, evocative, genre-reinforcing language. You know, barfing forth apocalyptica, fantastica, cyberpunkia, or whatever. I've seen DMs able to come up with just a ton of cool stuff, whether during prep or during play, very, very quickly. But I find that when I go to do so, I'm usually slow, and I'm often not quite happy with what I came up with. I know that consuming a bunch of media of any genre is going to help you think in that genre, but even then, are there better or worse ways of consuming? Or are there any other avenues I should be pursuing to get better at this sort of thing? What's your advice? A question from Haragorn. All right, Haragorn. So... The phrase Aragorn, which to me is just such a good name. I'm just imagining Aragorn from Lord of the Rings, but with like a big poofy 
like David Lee Roth haircut. Anyway, um, so the phrase Herogorn is referring to here, uh, barf forth apocalyptica. Uh, if you ever had the opportunity to uh, to see my my sweet punk rock denim vest in person, I have a big patch on the back that says barf forth apocalyptica because I think it's a beautiful question. Uh, it's a beautiful statement. This is a great question about it. It comes from the role playing game, surprise, surprise, Apocalypse World, and it's one of Apocalypse World's eleven principles inherent to GMing that game correctly. Uh, it goes a little something like this. Um, Barf forth apocalyptica. Cultivate an imagination full of harsh landscapes, garish bloody images, and grotesque juxtapositions. In Apocalypse World, when the rain falls, it's full of black grit, like toner and all the plant's leaves turn gray from absorbing it. Out among the wrecked cars, wild dogs fight for territory and with each other and with the rats, and one of the breeds is developing a protective inner eyelid of blank bone. If you get too close to them, you can hear the click click when they blink. So like so much of Apocalypse World, this is a really good principle to apply to any genre heavy role playing game. And honestly, is there a role playing game that doesn't rely on its genre? I don't think so. Not any good ones, at least. So it's a really good principle buried deep, deep under Vincent's apocalypse prose. So you might not have noticed it the first time through the book. It's kind of purple. It, you kind of, like, it's easy to blow past, right? Because basically on the surface, all it says is just like make up apocalypse shit, right? Which most, I think, experienced GMs, most GMs that don't read the book properly will just say, well, fucking duh, just like describe apocalyptic stuff, like no shit. But what I think Vincent is saying here is summed up really nicely in cultivating an imagination, right? Cultivate an imagination. And that, I think, is a skill that applies to every single role-playing game that exists. It's a skill that, as a GM, you can live in to become better. You know, it's a statement about immersing yourself in the mindset of your genre. In this case, it's about thinking about ways to bend and twist your brain, ergo your narration, your, your thought process, towards eliciting a particular apocalypse-themed reaction from your players, right? You're not just holding a birthday party, you're holding an apocalypse-themed birthday party. You want to get your players to, in this case, uh, feel harsh landscapes, garish bloody images, grotesque juxtapositions. Right? Those are all very evocative phrases. You're not just trying to make them see things. You're not just describing shit, right? It's not a bunker. It's a bunker oozing ra black rainwater. It's a bunker lying cracked on the pavement like a dead tortoise. It's, it's about evoking bloody, garish grotesqueries, right? So this goes to being a bit poetic about the way you GM. And I think that it works equally well, as our question asker puts it, to think of it in terms of impromptu, evocative, genre-reinforcing language. Now, especially the last bit, but impromptu is part of the question. Impromptu is a big part of the question. And I think that that's where the trick comes in. So how do we do that? How do we create impromptu, evocative, genre-reinforcing language? God, it just, it's fun to say. If it's not too embarrassing and there's no one around, just go ahead and say it out loud. It's a great phrase. Impromptu, evocative, genre-reinforcing language. Thank you for that, Harrigorn. Anyway, so how do we do this? We practice. First and foremost, we practice. We do it and we do it and we do it poorly because what feels clumsy and difficult the first time we do it will be much easier the second and eventually become part of the natural flow over time. And this means that, yes you will be bad at it. And yes, you will later be unwilling to look back at the recorded episodes of your early role-playing game campaigns on Twitch.tv and you will, you will choose to just not watch them because you know you are better now than you were then. And if, for example, someone links you a YouTube clip that you did not expect that is from an early episode of one of those shows, you will watch it and you will say, damn, that was terrible, but that's okay. Because a smart cartoon dog I know once said, sucking at something 
is the first step towards becoming kind of good at something. And I think that's a lesson that we all need to internalize as game masters, right? Because you're never good the first time. I don't care how talented you are. There's always things to learn, and you will always look back at your old work and say, you know, I'm better now than I was then. But some tricks that are going to help get you to the impromptu barf place, the impromptu place in which Apocalyptica or Cybernetica or Fantasia spew forth from your word hole, some tricks that will get you to that place without feeling too shitty about it are making lists. Making lists will free you. Making lists will, will break your chains and give you a way out of that terror of making something from nothing feeling, right? And I don't just mean downloading lists from the internet. I don't just mean stealing lists from other people or from other games, because you can do that, that's fine. Lots of games, Apocalypse World included, include lists in which you can, you know, pick to just describe things. If you don't have any elf names, you keep naming everybody Throndir, just find a list of elf names, that's fine, but that's not what I mean. I mean the process of sitting down and taking shit from your brain, good or bad, and making it into a list yourself on a piece of paper, right? Get your GM notebooks out. Open them to a blank page. Write the, the genre you are working on above, and then just list some shit, right? A clever description, cool mutation, the names of, of uh, cyberpunk corporations, Elven stars, whatever. Make your list and brainstorm, right? Just the process of making that list is going to get your brain sharp. You're going to start writing these names and you're going to be like, oh, I wonder who this person could be. Oh, cool. Well, this is a new name I hadn't thought of. Or, oh, what, what could this place be like? What is this corporation like? Let the name come first. In this case, a lot of the time when you're creating something for a game, you create the thing and then you name it. And that's fine, that makes sense. But if you name something first and then fill in the space around it, it's a much more rewarding creative experience. So do that, do that shit. Later, you can refer to those lists by just grabbing something at random if you want to, or a year, two years, whatever down the line, you can take your GM notebook off the shelf because you've filled a few by now because you're good note takers. And you can look at that list and be like, what the hell is all this crap? And you never know. There might be a campaign setting waiting for you lurking in that list, right? Amidst the Throndiers and the Quandiers and the Boromus names, you might find something that you like. Um, here's another thing that I like to do, and this is incredibly nerdy, and I get that I'm a dork, but you wouldn't be here if I wasn't. So this is the thing I like to do. And I will, I, I will answer you right now. I'm not ever releasing the audio for these, but I will describe the same thing to myself. I often record the audio so I can go back and listen to it. I describe the same thing to myself in a couple of different genres. Uh, I try to imagine a location or a place or a character or a, a scene of some action. And I describe it to myself uh, as if I was describing it to my players in a different genre. So I'll imagine a, a person. Let's say we imagine a, we imagine a woman, uh, an NPC. We, just, we imagine a woman in our head, right? So we've got an idea of maybe what she looks like. Now, let's describe her as if we were playing a science fiction game. Let's imagine this person, same person, same skin color, same hair color, same features. Let's describe them in a spaceship, right? Uh, let's describe them in a 1920s horror game. Let's describe them as a fantasy adventurer. Don't change their, her details. Don't change who she is fundamentally, but find different ways to describe what she's already looks like and, and is like in your head. Put her in different places. Describe these locations differently. Um, and what this is going to let you do is lean on the less literal side of the apocalyptica. It's going to let you lean on the idea of imparting detail by way of genre, which goes back to our second question about cinematics, you would not describe the same shot in Lord of the Rings, even though, let's imagine, let's imagine you're describing a shot of a, like an establishing shot of some mountains and a forest. The shot in one movie, the shot in Star Trek, right, would not be the same shot as the shot in Lord of the Rings. Soundtrack's different, pacing is different, the amount of time they spend on it is different, the colors are different, right? Star Trek might be all like blown out and hyper contrasty, right? Whereas Lord of the Rings might be soft, it might be more pastel, 
Think about these things because you're describing the same shit, but you're describing it in different ways, right? Do this by yourself, practice, give yourself some space to make that shit up, right? And then on top of all this, and I think this speaks directly to what the, the asker here, what Aragorn, sorry, Haragorn, uh, asked, right? Understand the languages of the genres that you are describing, right? We talked about this before for inspiration, but I'm not just saying inspiration. This is learning a language, right? Be a visual linguist for the kinds of narrative space you want your game to occupy, right? Watch movies, read books, look at pictures, go to the museum. If you're researching something for GMing, and, and this is, I haven't talked about this before, but it's important. If you're researching something for GMing, you're not really absorbing it the same way as if you're just watching it for pleasure and vice versa. If you think that watching every episode of Bleach is going to uh, get you in the right mindset for um, you know, running your supernatural anime game, I mean, maybe if you're lucky, but you're not doing it for research. You're just letting it go into your brain especially at first. You can cultivate a much speedier version of this, but honestly, when you're trying to cultivate your brain to pick up on media, you really have to do a lot of pausing, taking notes, rewinding, and being aware not only of the, uh, the extra ego of the film or the movie you're watching, um, but aware of the ego itself being observed, uh, right? Be aware of your own reaction to the things that you're watching, right? You can pick, you can pick a thing that you love already. You've seen a hundred times. It's a really great place to start, um, and, and watch it, but pause constantly. Pause, reflect on the scene. What about it made you feel something? What about it made it feel part of its genre? Look at things like lighting. Look at things like, uh, dialogue. Look at things like the soundtrack and how did those affect your, experience of that media, right? One fun thing that I like to do, watch something with someone who gives a shit about movies or TV shows. Like, you know who I mean? Like, you, you, we all have friends that are like this. Watch something you love that they've never seen before and then ask them what they thought of it and why it made them feel the way that it did, right? Because honestly, for yourself, it can be very hard, right? I know my feelings about Blade Runner my feelings about Star Wars, my feelings about these things, they are cemented. They're not going to change too much. I'm going to change, and the way I see them, they're going to change. But observing the thing with someone else who's never seen it before always gives me some kind of insight, right? The first time that I ever realized that um, uh, Decker in Blade Runner is a total fucking sleaze was because I watched that movie with someone who hadn't seen it before who was like, wow, the main character in this is a fucking dirtbag. And I was like, oh, you know what? He really is. And we went back and we watched a couple of the scenes and we talked about why it was like that. So, you know, think about iconic shit from the things you love. The opening scene of Star Wars, right? The, the Tantive being chased by this massive Star Destroyer. Why is that so iconic to science fiction? What about that makes us feel feelings that are going to set the stage for Star Wars? Why is the scene uh, on the rooftop in Blade Runner, you know, with the dove and the rain and the tears and the Z-beams, <laughs> why, why is that such a fundamentally sci-fi noir moment? What about that imparts meaning to us? And what can we as GMs steal for those things, right? Stop, rewind, make notes, listen hard, focus on different things every time and think about how you can repurpose those things for your game. Nothing is new. Right? The better you get at absorbing things, the more you're going to be able to distill them. There's a chemistry to this. You, you, bathe, you bathe media in the powerful acid of your own imagination. You separate out the elements. And now you can start using shit from Blade Runner in Dungeons and Dragons. You can start using Lord of the Rings in your urban fantasy. You can mix and match shit that would never otherwise go together because you've distilled them down to just the core fundamental elements. They're not tied to their genre anymore. They're just tied to the feeling you felt. So you can start to, uh, start to mix and match them. Um, and you know what? Like I said before, don't be afraid to be slow or inexpert at first. You're going to learn. I mean, we all do. 
Uh, it's a struggle that comes with being a creative person, doing a creative job. If you're improving, you're always going to feel better about the things you made today than the things you made yesterday. And as such, you're probably going to hate that stuff, right? Maybe a little, maybe a lot. You'll come to peace with it over time, but that's okay, right? GMing is not a straight line from the bad place to the good place. Everything that you make has merit of some kind, even if the only merit is because you fucked up and you learned to do better the next time. Um, in the same way that watching a movie with your friends and then talking about it afterwards helps you understand the thing better, playing a role-playing game and talking about it with your friends afterwards, or I am fucking blessed. I am, you, you are, and I, I'm speaking to you as an audience that absorbs my content, you are a godsend. You are all making me a better game master because I have thousands of people that I can sit down with after a show and be like, so how did I do? Right? And we can talk about the things that you loved, the things that impacted you, the things that made you feel feelings, or the things that missed, the things you didn't notice, the things that weren't that relevant. And so I, I think that if you can do that with your players, uh, that is a really great start. And honestly, if you really want to get serious about this stuff, read some film studies books, go to the library. God bless libraries. Go to the library, take out some film studies books, Listen to interviews, watch documentaries about Kubrick and Spielberg and Tarantino, uh, take a film studies class, learn about Leni Riefenstahl. If you can afford to access education about this stuff and have the time for it, I don't just mean afford in terms of money, but like if you have the time and the money for this stuff, like take a course, go to the, go to the community center and, and hang out with other film nerds talking about film, watch YouTube videos, listen to podcasts, absorb media that's already questioning media because that shit, once you get the language for it down, you're gonna start seeing things in the stuff that you love that you never noticed before and that's gonna make you a better game master, right? You are, if you're, if you're GMing, whether it's for one person or five people or an audience of thousands, you are a creator of media. You are making things. And as a GM, you're a creator of interactive media, no less, which is, the hardest, most demanding kind of media there is. So the better educated you are about it, the better you're gonna be, right? There's lots of different ways to absorb media, but this is one way that I think you can learn to be a better game master indirectly. You don't need to open your Dungeon Master's Guide for this one. Plus it'll just make you a better person. Knowing about film and TV and paintings and sculpture, that shit will make you a better human being. Art makes us better. so. Go and engage in art, but do it with your GM cap on. I hope it's like one of those Sherlock ones or with like an ear flaps hat. Whatever it looks like, put your GM cap on and go and engage with some media and it will make you better, I promise. So that's it for today. Uh, this has been Office Hours. Uh, I feel really passionate about some of the topics we talked about today. So hopefully you, uh, you felt some of that uh, coming through. If you want to get involved in the, uh, the old Office Hours, you can do so by going to my website, www.adam-coble.com slash office-hours. Fill out the form. I love seeing your questions in my inbox. So go get on that, and I will continue answering the questions as we get to them uh, every Monday here on twitch.tv and uh, every Thursday on YouTube. So thanks for coming, everybody. I hope you had a great time, and we will talk to you next time. Bye for now.